Hi, hey, welcome everyone. This is the FRO workshop. Today, uh, I'll be having some co-presenters. I'm Donald Sharp, by the way, and we'll have some co-presenters, Olivier Dujan and Moba Shara Basul. Since the XDDP workshop went fairly over and I believe lunch is next, um, I think we'll drop the recent major changes in BGP RFC compliance from the talk and just focus on the actual code and and, um, and <clears throat> recent changes to FRR. So we'll be covering segment routing, MLD, PIMV6, and resilient next talk groups. And the first segment, segment routing, will be talked by Olivier. Okay. All right, so Mubash, uh, let's talk about MLD and PIMV6. Yeah, sure, Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Mubashira Rasool. I am a senior member technical staff in VMware. Today, we will be discussing about MLD and PIM V6 development, which we have been doing so far in this year in the FRR community. So the agenda for today will be, uh, let's go to the next slide, Don. So the agenda for today uh, is as follows. We will be discussing about MLD and PIM V6 RFC. And we will look into various design approaches and we will look into some of the configurations and how we, we can do debugging and logging. And we we'll also go through one of the sample configuration and then check out the kernel dependencies and answer the questions if you have any. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, as we all know, MLD is the protocol which runs between host to router whereas PIM is the protocol which runs between routers. And in the community, we are supporting MLD v1 and MLD v2 as per the RFCs 2710 and 3810, whereas PIM v6 is supported as per RFC 7761. So let's go to the next slide. So uh, this uh, we will just discuss about the various design approaches which we thought, which we went through and then finalized on the one. And the first design approach we thought was, we already have the PIMD daemon. So the PIM protocol is common. So why not reuse the same code, reuse the same daemon? But then it has several, several disadvantages. It, it will have scalability issues and then uh, since there will be too much dependency on e each other, if anything goes wrong with IPv4 multicast, it will take down IPv6 as well. So because of these disadvantages, we discarded this design. Let's move on to the second design approach. So in this one, what we thought of is let's keep the same demo, but uh, we can run PIMv6 protocol as a separate thread and PIMv4 protocol as a separate thread. And we can have a main thread which will uh, interact between these two, and it will also interact with Zebra and, and uh, to get the next job and interface information and things like that. So this will resolve our problem of the scalability issue. Like, okay, not too many things are running on the same uh, thread, but it will make it would have made our uh, code complex, and also there will be database concurrency issues. And so maintainability wise also, it's not good. So we have started with the solution as well. And then let's move on to the approach. Yeah, this is the current design which we have implemented in the community. So here, what we did is, since PIM is the common protocol for IPv4 and IPv6, so the same code can be extended to support both IPv4 and IPv6. And kept the same code and we extended the code, uh, but we spawned two demons. So one will run for PIM v4 and the other will run for PIM v6. So this way we resolved our pre previous problems and uh, for IGMP and MLD code, we kept separate files. So like IGMP is for v4 and MLD is for v6. So these will be compiled only for the respective uh, uh, versions. And we extended the data structures and to, to accommodate IPv6. Next slide. So yeah, this is how it looks. So PIMD has the IGMP and PIM. 
whereas uh, PIM 6D daemon has MLD and PIM. And uh, because of several advantages over here, we finalized this approach. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So yeah, these were the design approaches. And then we have implemented the commands. Like for MLD, we have several commands to enable the MLD. Then we, we have command for uh, joining the groups, like IPv6 MLD join, and then to tune certain parameters, which as per the RSVs, like class member query interval, class member query count, all these can be configurable using these commands. And to change the version, we can use IPv6 and the version command. Let's go to the next slide. So this one is for PIM v6. These are the PIM v6 configuration commands. To configure RP, we can use IPv6 PIM RP commands. And then to configure join tune interval or keep life timer, all these can be configured using these commands. Let's go to the next slide. And then we have few uh, commands on the interfaces as well to enable the PIM v6 protocol on the interface and to even mark the interface as passive. So we can use IPv6 PIM passive command to do so. If you want to tune in the parameter of hello, we can use IPv6 PIM hello timer command. And then to change the DR priority, we can use IPv6 PIM DR priority as well. Let's go to the next slide. We have also implemented uh, a set of show commands, which can help us to see what data is present at any point of the at any point of time in MLD or PIM. So we have all these uh, CLIs like if we want to see the groups and what MLD groups are present, we can use show IPv6 MLD groups. If we want to see what interfaces are enabled, MLD enabled, we can use show IPv6 MLD interface. Then for join similarly. And then we want to see what multicast routes for IPv6 are installed. We can use show IPv6 and route and uh, things like that. All these two neighbors, next stop, PIM join interface. We can use these commands. I have just listed very few commands. We have implemented more than this. So I have attached the link at the uh, below. So interested folks can go through that link. Let's see the next one. Yeah. So for debugging and logging, we have implemented several commands. So if uh, someone wants to debug some MLD issue, then we have specific to MLD debug commands. If you want to debug PIMv6 so packets, some, some, something goes wrong, suppose, in register packets. So then we can use the debug PIMv6 packets command to do so. And uh, there are a lot of commands for MLD. These can be logged into a file using the log file var log frr command. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's very easy to configure MLD and PIMV6. So the basic requirement is you know, first we should have all these routers connected by any of the unicast protocols. We can use OSPF, BGP or static. It's, it's on you, if anything uh, if we can configure. It. And then once these are all connected, we have to we enable the MLD on the receive between the router and the receiver, and we have to enable PIM using IPv6 PIM command between all the routers, and we have to tell all the routers who is the RP. So for that, we have the command IPv6 PIM RP and RP address. So RP should be reachable, and once you configure all this, it's all up. The receiver can start sending the join. The uh, source can start sending the traffic. So as shown in the first diagram, first the host B and host C are receivers. They, they will start sending the joins towards RP, shown by the green arrows. So it will go uh, and all the star G and multicast IPv6 routes will be installed. And then in the second diagram, we can see that source has started sending the IPv6 multicast packet. It will send to the RP using the register message and then RP will have the M routes installed. So it will forward these packets. And at the end, we will see all the SDM routes installed in all of the routes. Let's go to the next slide. So this one here, uh, we have just added 
snapshot of three nodes, we can see the how the M routes are installed on all these nodes like LHR and FHR and at RP. So here we can see that the source, are, we can see all the information like what are the sources, what are the groups, how these are installed via which protocol, is it because of MLB or is it because of PIM? And we can see which is the input interface and the list of output interface. Yeah, next slide, please. And this is the last slide. This is for about kernel dependency. So wrong miss whole event was not present in the kernel. So this has been added this year and the patch is merged and it is available in 5.19.16 stable version. So yeah, we can use Linux for IPv6 forwarding. So Mobash, when will this be ready in FRR? So it's almost uh, ready. Uh, the feature is up and working. We, we are doing the testing. In the next release, it will be available. As a uh, as beta or as full, fully ready for the end operator. In the next release, it will be fully available. Okay. Um, what would you do differently now that you've done the project, and you're looking back? What would you like to change or fix? <laughs> change or fix? Okay. You don't have to answer that if you don't want to. <laughs> David can help answer that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, Mobash. Um, yeah, you're welcome. I'm going to move back to uh, let Olivier. I believe Olivier is ready to present now. Yes. Hello, everybody. Perfect. So, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, hello everybody. So let me introduce myself. So I'm uh, Olivier Dujon, working for Orange Innovation Networks, and uh, I'm a research uh, R&D engineer and making most uh, of my research uh, area in traffic engineering. So this includes uh, RSVP traffic engineering, of course, but uh, also path computation element and um, segment routing which is the, the talk of uh, of today so um next next uh, slide please yeah so what is segment routing so segment routing could be seen as a uh, new architectures that leverage the source routing paradigm that uh, mostly uh, past decade was uh, forbidden uh, in operator networks uh, just because uh, for security problem but well um this time with segment routing, we could aim to decide at the hidden routers which will be um, the following path and to encode in the packet header uh, this path. And of course, the longer the path, the bigger will be the stack uh, of this uh, kind of segment identifier. So segment routing starts uh, earlier uh, in, in past decade and uh, working group, spring uh, working group was devoted uh, in IETF in uh, 2013 uh, 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 and operators uh, already deployed segment routing in their network since uh, two, three years now. And this greatly simplify the management of their IPM PLS networks and allow uh, to protect them with fast reroute and path diversity in a more simpler uh, fashion where uh, compared to standard LDP and RSVP traffic engineering. So uh, the goal is to present how we implement uh, segment routing in uh, free range routing to, to provide an important source of implementation and uh, discuss uh, some limitations. So next slide, please. So just a, a brief recap to uh, what is segment routing. So segment routing is composed by a segment identifier and there is two kind of segment identifier. There is the node, uh, the node seed, 
which design a router. So typically, a router R1 could be a 101 uh, segment identifier. And it means that forward packet using the IGP shortest path to this node identified by this seed. So if I'm uh, in router R9 and send a packet with this uh, 101 um, identifier, this packet will be automatically routed up to this router. And there is a second kind of identifier, which is the adjacency seed. And adjacency seed just um, identify a link, a particular link between uh, two routers. And it means forward the packet using this specific interface identifier uh, by the seed. So with this uh, adjacency seed, the packet will go only up to the next uh, routers. So next slide, please. So in terms of um, uh, mm, the, the way segment routing is working, uh, there is two twofold. The first is the control plane. So these segment identifier are exchanged between routers using the standard routing protocol and without uh, required uh, a new a new signaling, uh, like for previously in MPLS, uh, we will LDP label distribution protocol or RSVP traffic engineering protocol. And it's uh, automatically, the router automatically install in its MPLS um, uh, table, uh, the corresponding uh, instruction. So in terms of label, or in terms of IPv6 uh, routes, um, how to reach um, these routers identified by the segment identifier. So control plane have been modified for OSPF and ISIS to add this kind of segment routing information as new uh, TLV in OSPF LSA or ISIS LSP. And then in terms of data plane, there is two different data plane. One, which is MPLS, where the segment identifier are coded as simple label. And um, uh, there is no need to modify the MPLS data plane in this case. It's completely a uh, control plane modification. And uh, with ISIS or SPF v3, it's compatible also with IPv6. And the second data plane is the um, IPv6 data plane, and generally named SRV6 compared to SRMPLS. And uh, in this case, the segment identifier is encoded in a new IPv6 header, uh, header named SRH, segment routing header. Uh, well, but this need to modify the data plane to be able to process uh, this kind of packet. And um, the stacking uh, is very uh, consuming many, many um, packets, many uh, overhead. And so IETF is currently looking to how compress uh, this uh, SRH, this IPv6 either, and for what they name something as microseed, but it's ongoing work. There is plenty of uh, different proposals on the table and they have not yet um, uh, converge. And the main principle is, for example, C1 in the bottom of, fig of the figure would send a packet to C2. It simply uh, send it to, to uh, its um, provider edge routers, which encapsulate uh, the packet with this uh, segment uh, identifier. So for example, 102 label, and then the packet is sent to uh, next routers, which uh, with its MPLS table, route the packet to uh, to this uh, router two, and router two have just to de-encapsulate the packet before delivering to CE2. So next uh, slide, please. So the aim of also with segment routing is not only to simplify uh, the way an IP MPLS network uh, is managed, uh, but also to perform some traffic engineering or what we name also tactical routing. 
In this case, we reused uh, the possibility to stack label in MPLS data plane. And in this case, instead of pushing uh, a simple uh, label on top of a packet, we push a, a stack of label. And in this case, the packet will completely change uh, the, the route and go with an alternate route. And typically, for example, going through uh, the pink, green, gray, blue uh, routers before reaching the yellow routers. And the operation consists to look at the label stack, uh, the top of the label stack, and if it's my label, if it's my segment identifier, I just pop and look to the next label and then route packet to according to uh, the next label or the next segment identifier in case of IPv6. And well, thanks to Linux kernel that allow up uh, to stack 32 uh, label, which was not the case at the beginning and mostly because we we look to this possibility of stacking label um, within FRR. Uh, some proposals have been uh, merged into Linux kernel since version 4.15 that allow this to um, uh, stack uh, this number of label and it allows us to address uh, all kind of, uh, of path and disregarding uh, the, uh, the, the networks because we consider that up to 16 labels could express any path in any kind of networks. So next one, please. So um, the implementation in FRN starts in 2018 uh, with OSPF first and continue in mid uh, 2019 with ISIS. So we include uh, then during the two, uh, last two years uh, many enhancements, uh, in particular the possibility to dynamically um, allocate uh, SRGB, so a segment routing global block and a segment routing local block. This is the range of label you used uh, to allocate the segment ID and adjacency uh, seed. We also implement the loop-free alternate, uh, which enable the link and not protection, and also ECMP, which was originally uh, done for ISIS, but uh, added for OSPF. And what we have um, also as new pull request is the possibility to perform what we name flex algorithm, where in this case, we completely uh, add traffic engineering and uh, with dynamic for, for example, so colored admin group policy for root computation. And in this case, uh, you could have different segment identifier for the same prefix, but using different routes, just because for example, you would have some traffic going to uh, fast delay path computation and some traffic going to uh, slower, uh, path but consuming more bandwidth. And so this kind of flexible algorithm allows us to compute a different IGP path based on different policy, different metric. And again, this is also uh, incoming RFC in IETF. And so the, the main purpose is to have centralized all this MPLS table stuff management in Zebra. OSPF and ISIS just request the label range and then push, modify, delete uh, label per prefix uh, through the Zebra and Zebra also transmit this to the Linux kernel or through uh, FPM and connectivity to an ASIC uh, for a dedicated white box hardware. Next slide, please. So uh, here it is some simple configuration of, of the uh, segment routing. So you have just to enable the segment routing, fix the global block. You could also fix what we name the node uh, MSD. MSD is maximum seed depth. So it is the maximum uh, label stack you could push in front of a packet. And then you could add some 
uh, index per prefix, so both here IPv4 and IPv6. So resulting that we could collect information uh, on segment routing nodes, so you could collect the different SRGB, SRLib, uh, SR local block per uh, device, and then you could have also uh, the allocation of the MPLS table and the prefix seed. So next slide. So in parallel and in complement to segment routing, a new diamond has been um, pushed to free range routing, which is PAVD. So PAVD enable the possibility to set up some uh, local T path computation with some color policy and have also the possibility to connect to a dedicated uh, path computation element uh, server through PCEP protocol, typically an open daylight uh, SDN uh, controller. And it allowed to push new uh, traffic engineering configuration dynamically uh, or through configuration and requesting path computation. And for example, allowing to have a primary path and a backup path with path diversity and um, uh, and some root, uh, on demand uh, routing. So next slide, please. So to, to conclude, um, free range routing provide an open source implementation of uh, segment routing, which is uh, interoperable with commercial routers who have made several tests against uh, Cisco, Juniper, and so on. And uh, it allowed to, to motivate service provider to, to faster uh, the deployment of uh, segment routing and optimize network resource uh, exploitation with link and node protection. And um, as coming soon, it's a flex algorithm, which is uh, on target. We have also the integration with ASIC data plane within Sonic uh, distribution. And next plan is to perform uh, inter-area segment routing and also implement SRV6 uh, data plane integration into ISIS to be uh, enabled to also have this uh, over data plane. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Olivier. Um, are there any questions? Doesn't look like it. All right, I'll move on to, um, how much time do we have, David? 10 minutes or so? Uh, yeah, 12, like. Okay. All right, so um, the next uh, section I, I want to talk about is resilient next talk groups. Um, Resilient Next Talk groups were introduced uh, a year or so ago to the Linux kernel by Ido Shimo. Um, what they are effectively is you can specify at Next Talk group creation time a number of buckets to use, and each of the Next Talks specified in that group will be distributed evenly throughout those buckets. And the real key factor here is that suppose we lose a next stop, in this case, three, instead of refiguring the algorithm, refiguring the hash, I'm sorry, and um, and calls and flows to be interrupted, uh, the buckets used by the third next stop will just be replaced with the other next stops. In this case, one, two, four, and five will just be filled in. And all those flows that were in, used in those buckets would immediately start <coughs> using the new next stop specified. Um, each bucket gets a last use timer, which can be queried from the kernel. Um, when you create the next top resilient next top group, there's an idle timer, at which case uh, that's the time at which the, the bucket is considered idle. So if you specify 60 seconds and the bucket hasn't been used in 60 seconds, it's considered idle. And you also specify an unbalanced timer where the um, the next type group gets refigured and forced into balance. All right, so that's how it works. Um, as I said, this was added to the 519 kernel. Um, if you're interested, you can go look at the, the kernel docs for it. And there's a pull to implement 
a pull request to implement resilient next five groups in FRR. And basically all you really need to do is uh, create a next five group and uh, specify resilient buckets, uh, number of buckets, the idle timer, known balance timer, and it will automatically create that in, um, in the rib. Uh, currently next top groups are used by the BGP, PBR, and uh, Shark D. I hope to have Static D use this as well in the near future. Um, All right. Uh, so, so how does it? How was it implemented? Uh, effectively, the CLI was was placed in libnexttopgroup.c with a series of callbacks that individual demons could uh, register for for when the CLI is changed. Um, there's five, six of the add next top group, delete next top group, modify next top group, add and remove next tops. Um, the modify next dot group callback is used to signal the resilient next dot group changes. Um, one key thing here, though, is that when you create a resilient next dot group in the kernel, you cannot change it back and forth to a non resilient next dot group. So you have to specify the resilient next dot group first. Um, when the demons receive a callback that the next dot group is resilient, it will install into the zebra. And Zebra takes it and programs the kernel. Um, one of the features that Nick Resilient Next Talk Groups provides is the ability to um, uh, query the state of the Next Talk Group. Uh, that's not currently in the implementation, but I hope to have it in the near future. I've already got code written to do some of it, just haven't finished it yet. All right, um, the next thing I want to talk about was uh, recent major changes. I'm going to try to keep this quick and fast. Um, uh, and I just want to try to cover the last year of features. Um, the next release of FRR is coming November 1st. It's going to be 8.4. Uh, a lot of changes. This release is more bug fixes than um, than anything else. Modulus the PEM six D change, <coughs> which Mobosh spoke about. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, here's just a bunch of features that have come in over the last year, and BGP and Zebra. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going over it. Um, and here's some more features that came in for OSBF v3 is is and PBR as well. Um, one thing I did want to talk about is as part of any new feature or bug fix, um, one of the things we've been asking people to do is, is write topology tests and our code coverage has gone up 5% in the last year, which is actually, I was actually kind of surprised when I ran the numbers. It's, it's, it's hard to write topology tests that cover code on a regular basis and keep that up. But it's, since it's a requirement, we've actually got pretty good buy-in from the community to, to continue increasing our coverage. Another, uh, Code goodness thing that we do is rerun rerun Covery static analysis. They have a free version that you can register online and run your code against. Um, I just wanted to show that you know we've been regularly fixing the Covery bugs, uh, issues or problems found, and uh, we've actually upgraded twice in the last year. And you can see the the bump each time that the new version of Coverity has found more issues that we've had to start fixing. All right, um, the next section is uh, BGP RFC compliance. And uh, most of this work has actually been done by Donatus Abritus. Um, so I'm pretty sure he's in the audience today. So thanks, Donatus. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, so so Donatus, when Donatus came on board to the community, he just kind of uh, started fixing BGP issues and started doing RFC compliance. And um, I, it's really awesome that we have someone who's who's taken that that mantle up and working on it. Uh, this is just a list of some of the RFC. Well, most of the RFC changes that have come in in the last couple of years and fixes and uh, features. <clears throat> All right, so I want to go over uh, a few of the uh, more important ones and how they were configured. Uh, the first one is uh, long live graceful restart for BGP. Effectively, you can um, specify that you want BGP to do uh, uh, a grace restart and uh, the amount of time you want the routes to be considered stale before removing them. Um, also, the RFC specifies a, a community that you can use to, to control individual prefixes if you want them around longer or not. All right, uh, RFC 9003 provides uh, extended BGP administrative shutdown support. Uh, you can use up to 255 octets or characters to have a shutdown message so you can be more prescriptive. Uh, RFC 9072 was really nothing more than, I, I think, uh, an administrative thing for BGP where the capabilities part of the BGP open message was starting to get filled up and was limited to 255 octets. And this just provides a way to allow you to uh, extend that beyond 255. And you can configure that with the extended optional parameters for the neighbor statement. Um, RFC 8538 provides uh, notification mesh support for BGP Grace Restart. This basically allows you to uh, allows BGP to extend the uh, graceful when graceful restart notification notification can be used and where it can be used and and also you can specify if you want to um, do a hard administrative reset instead of the um, instead of a graceful restart for whatever reason. Uh, unequal cost. Load balancing is a feature brought in by draft IETF IDR link bandwidth. Effectively, you can specify through extended communities uh, the bandwidth associated with the link, and BGP will take that into account and create an unequal cost load, ba ba uh, load balancing across those next stops. So you can see on the, the, the right here the Speed, the bandwidth translates to weight, which is used to the kernel for how to load the, the, um, the next hops. Uh, RFC 8097 provides uh, prefix of origin validation. Um, <clears throat> if you're using RPKI and matching for validity or not validity of uh, prefixes, you can um, use now send the RPKI value state through um, communities to peers and they can make decisions about what to do with a valid or non-valid um, route from past information. This effectively, this allows you to centralize your RPKI server instead of having it everywhere. Uh, Route leak prevention and detection using roles and update and open messages. Effectively, you can specify on neighbor relationship what kind of role a peer is to you. So you can say, for instance, I'm the provider and uh, my neighbor is a customer. And you can use those roles to figure out if you should be seeing routes from them or not seeing them. It's just a more prescriptive way of, of keeping track of how BGP is being used in the in the in the network, and uh, RFC seven six eleven allows uh, BGP to route release on route leak on a PE between verfs that wasn't effectively allowed before, and. Uh, RFC 7311, uh, which is accumulate IGP metric attribute for BGP, allows you to use the metric passed from a uh, from a IGP instead of BGP as part of the best path decision. 
instead. All right, um, that's everything. Is there, are there any questions or things we'd like to discuss? It does not look like it. Let me check the room if there is anything online. All right, it does not look like it. All right. I'd like to thank uh, Remobosh and Olivier again for presenting. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Well, we are actually on time to go to break. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, if you have any questions, you can find Donatos or I or anyone else you can identify with FRR around uh, in person here. Or you can just find us on Slack. Um, there's a public Slack for FR routing. You just need to go through the website. It will automatically send you an invite link. We also have a weekly technical meeting that anyone's more than welcome to come to. And if you're interested, you know, speak to uh, me or David there about how to get to it. It's weekly and every, it's on Tuesdays. Yeah, it's every Tuesdays, uh, European <clears throat> afternoon, US lunch time, I think. Morning. Depending on where you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks. <laughs>